In the last video, we left untyped lambda calculus with two showstoppers. First, it was possible to make it crash and explode into infinite recursion. Also, you could do silly things like put numbers into Boolean functions and strings into numerical functions with all sorts of chaos resulting. In this video, we are going to solve both of those problems by using type theory. But type theory is such a large topic, so we are going to cover it in three parts. In this video, I'm going to introduce the empty type, the unit type, and function type. Then I'm going to tell you all about the Curry-Howard correspondence, a powerful result that allows us to link computer programming with the writing of mathematical proofs. In the next video, I'm going to introduce product types, some types, and equality type. Finally, in the last video of this subsequence, we will cover type families, pi types, sigma types, and the natural numbers. These videos are going to introduce you to a form of Martin Loff type theory. There are other type theories out there, but once you have a handle on one of them, under your belt, you'll be able to convert your knowledge to the other type. Also, it is the type used in homotopy type theory, univari univariant foundations of mathematics, which is my primary resource for this video. When I say it's my primary resource, I mean that if I say anything correct about type theory, it is most likely from this book. And if there are any mistakes, it is most likely from me misunderstanding it. In type theory, everything has a property called its type. An entity's type basically tells you what it is, and we write the type like this. The object, then a colon, then the object's type. An entity can only have one type. So the counting number one is a distinct object from the rational number one. This might sound strange to you initially, but the two ones have different properties. You can divide the rational one by two, but you can't do that to the counting number one. You can subtract two from the rational number one. Again, something you can't do with counting number one. We say an entity inhabits a type if that thing is of that type, and we say a type is inhabited if an object of that type exists. Example time. Let's introduce a few simple types. The unit type. This is written by a bold number one and is defined to be inhabited by the single object point. By definition, this is the only object which is in within this type. Another useful type is the empty type. It is defined as being uninhabited. In other words, there is no entity with this type. Now, by themselves, they're not that interesting. And didn't we introduce typing to fix problems with lambda expressions? Well, let's create a type for functions. In type theory, functions also have type. A function's type is expressed like this, domain to codomain. So the type of the thing the function takes as an argument, a little arrow, and then the thing that the function will return on application. Like all types, a function type can be inhabited or uninhabited. And we can show a function type is inhabited by writing an example function which complies with that function's type. One of the most fundamental rules of type theory is that these functions must be total. That is, for every element inhabiting the domain, the function has to be able to produce some element that inhabits the codomain. Let's look at the function type unit to unit as an example. It is simple to show that this function is inhabited, giving the example function of x of type unit maps to x of type unit. We could also write this as point of type unit maps to point of type unit. When we have multiple entities inhabiting a type, we can use this style of using an entity rather than a variable on the left hand side to say which values map to which. How about the function type unit to empty? Well, the requirement is that for every item in the domain, we have to be able to produce an element from the codomain. However, there is nothing in empty. If a function is called with point as an argument, it can't return an element from empty because there's simply none of them. In a way, a function type is a like a trade offer. It says, if you 
give me a thing of domain type, then I will give you an object of codomain type. With the codomain type being empty, it is impossible to fulfill this deal because there's simply nothing to give. How about empty to unit? Well, the condition we have to fulfill is there has to be an output for every possible input. But if there are no input elements, it is trivial to fulfill this condition. Now, this might sound weird, but think about the trade offer analogy. You can offer anything so long as you know that nobody will ever take you up on that offer. The same reasoning works for empty to empty. This is also inhabited because there's no way we can call the bluff on the function in this situation. We can generalize this and make a handy chart of how inhabited and uninhabited types relate to function types. Let's stick this chart up in the corner of the screen. I am sure it will not become important or relevant at all in this video's future. If you are watching this video, then you have most likely watched other maths videos where somebody gives a convincing argument about why some mathematical fact is true, most likely along with a well-animated diagram. You might even think to yourself, why do we have all these symbols and proofs in mathematics? Can't we just do it with diagrams and explanation? And honestly, you're not wrong. For the vast majority of mathematics histories, diagrams and explanations is how maths work. However, as math developed, it got more and more abstract and further and further away from our concrete day-to-day -day experiences. Some of this was due to things like differential and integral calculus, making us have to deal with infinities. Physics starting to deal with scales so much larger and smaller than we normally expected. It just turns out that, yeah, that seems right, starts to stop working in the spaces where we don't have much day-to-day -day experience. The solution to this is when we had a maths fact that we were not quite sure of, we would start with the maths facts that everybody agrees with that were true, then take small steps in reasonings, steps that were so small and so simple that it was easy to check them for errors until we took enough steps to get to the fact that we wished to check. A math fact that might be right or might be wrong is called a proposition. The things that everybody agrees on are true are called axioms, and the collection of small steps that we are allowed to take from axioms towards propositions is called our logic. The string of logical steps from what is known to what is we wish to prove is called a proof. Rather than using English, French, Japanese, or some other natural language that can be ambiguous, mathematicians started to create a compact, unambiguous system of symbols. This is very powerful but it does mean to access the heart of mathematics, you have to learn a new language, which does create a problem for people doing maths education because you have to teach not just the ideas, but also the language in which you can express these ideas. These mathematical pioneers worked out techniques where you could start to do arithmetic to truth itself. You could then apply the tools of mathematics to mathematics. Mathematics is a tool. Just like machines are tools that extend the ability of the human body and allow us to do things our body was unable to do, mathematical notation is a tool that allows our minds to explore mathematical concepts that it could not do unaided. One of the key bits of mathematical logic is the implication, which re represents the concept of if-then in logic. It uses this bit of notation. This statement, A implies B, means if proposition A is true, then proposition B is true. We can represent how implication works with a truth table. If both A and B are true, then the implication must also be true as well. However, if A is true, and B was false, 
then that means that there's something wrong with the implication. So the implication must be false. How about when A is false? Well, that's the thing about implications. Like a sneaky genie, they don't tell you anything about the false case of A. So the implication is also true when A is false and B is true. And also if A is false and B is false. This truth table looks somewhat familiar. As logic became more formalized, it shifted away from using truth tables and started to be expressed in terms of rules of derivation. In this, in this more formal approach, math is made up of three parts. A language, that is the symbols and grammar that tells you how the symbols go together. A logic, the steps between propositions, or more generally, how the truth or falsity of one proposition affects the other proposition's truthfulness. And the axioms, the starting point from where our logic grows. A formal axionic system, or FAS for short. The most popular FAS is ZFC with classical logic. However, it is not the only one. Oh, and a quick tangent. This is why I get so frustrated with mathematical coups. If you want mathematics to do something, like have countable reals, or have a distinction between 0.9 repeating and 1, or whatever else, it is totally possible. You just have to come up with a FAS that will allow it. That mathematical system that you invented might have be even useful or interesting. However, to do it right requires you to invest the time to understand how mathematicians communicate and how to formalize mathematical ideas in math. To do otherwise would be like attempting to publish a book of Japanese love poems without knowing any Japanese. Anyway, the most popular alternative to classical ZFC is called constructivist mathematics. The goal of constructivist mathematics is that whenever you want to prove that something exists, you have to be able to construct it. That constructed thing is called a witness because like a witness, it stands as evidence of the proof. In constructivist mathematics, in order to prove that an alley squeeble exists, you would have to show how to create an alley squeeble. While in classical mathematics, you could do an indirect proof that an Ali Squeeble exists. For example, you could show that if you assume that Ali Squeebles don't exist, and then use this non-existence to show that some impossible condition results from Ali Squeebles' non-existence, that proves that Ali Squeebles must exist. You can't do this style of proof in constructivist logic because constructivist logic lacks the law of excluded middle. This classical law is expressed as A is true, or not A is true. Now, that sounds a bit obvious. If something is not false, then it must be true. So no matter what the truth of A is, one of these two must be true. However, just because it's obvious doesn't mean it is correct. And a cool thing in mathematics is we can do what-if experiments and explore alternative universes with different logics. In constructivist logic, if not not A is true, you cannot conclude that A is true. But why would we ever choose such a strange and limiting logic system? Some do it because they think it better fits what they think mathematics should look like. However, I think there's a far better reason. I am sure you've noticed that implications and functions look very much like each other. It turns out and everything in constructivist mathematics has a correspondence in type theory. A proposition corresponds to a type. A witness corresponds to a program that inhabits that type. An implication corresponds to function types. Not A corresponds to A to empty. As we will go on, we will fill in the rest of this table with other correspondence. Let's make a proof using type theory. Here is a very common proposition that you will normally have to prove as an assignment in your first logic class. This is a very useful property because it allows us to chain together strings of implication and have them collapse into a single implication. 
What is great about type theory is you can use a technique that I call the typed hole method to create your proof. We will start off with a hole, which is A to B to B to C to A to C type. Along the side, I'm going to list all the variables that are in scope. Currently, there are no variables in scope. Since this is a function type, we know that the whole must have an argument of A to B. So let's add that and we will shrink the whole to cover the unused types. A, B is now added to the list of our available variables. Now we can repeat the same reasoning and get the variable B, C. Again, our whole has a function type. Another argument this time, for the type A, leaving a hole of C. Now we have to find a way to generate an element of type C. Well, there is only one function in scope that will emit a C, and that is BC. But BC has to be called with an argument of type B, which leaves us with this hole. But we can get a B from the function AB, and we've already have a var that pro provides us with a object of type A. So here is our program, a witness of this proposition, thus proving it true. How about something more complex? Well, you know how I said that not not A isn't the same as A in constructivist logic? Well, curiously, not 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 a is the same as not a. This is called triple negative elimination, and it is something that we can prove. Even better, it's an example of something that doesn't seem immediately obvious. Let's start with our hole shaped with like the thing we wish to prove. Since the hole is a function type, we implement it by declaring an abstraction. In this case, introducing a variable and. Okay, now we have another function type. So we declare another abstraction for A. Now, the only function we have available that has empty as its return type is the and one. So we call that and introduce the whole for its argument. This whole is another function type. So again, we can introduce an abstraction and give it a new hole. Oh, we've gotten back to the empty type hole. However, we now have an as a var in this scope. So we can call that. Now with a hole of a, we can fill it in with the argument that we've given. And we have once again proven our result for triple negative elimination. Even though implication is very powerful, in order to have a fully featured system of logic, we're going to need something more. So in the next Spilling the Hot Tea video, we will be covering the equivalence of AND and OR, product types and subtypes. So please subscribe for that.